So welcome back, everybody. Hope you all uh, got a chance to grab a coffee or catch some rays or do a bit of networking. Um, and welcome uh, to the third segment of uh, National Digital Conference today. Um, and this third segment is hearing from regional government uh, le digital leaders um, and hearing their kind of views and perspectives on what coming out of the pandemic uh, is going to require from us all. Um, and again, another, um, we're all so agile here, aren't we? Um, in another uh, uh, departure from the public schedule, we're going to hear from uh, Sally Meacham first. She was our third speaker in the segment, but we're going to go straight to Sally. And I'd like to welcome Sally uh, on stage. So Sally is the Interim Chief Exec um, at Digital Public Services Wales, um, so in charge of this stuff in Wales, but she's done a whole range of roles, I'm sure most of us know. Um, so CEO at Cabinet Office Government Digital Service, uh, uh, CDTO at Crown Commercial Services, Digital Advisor Essex County Council, and uh, Digital Advisor at DEFRA as well, and uh, has a number of um, scars and war stories um, from the last 10, 15 years. So massive welcome, Sally. Nice to see you today. Um, and without any further ado, uh, over to you. Dying to hear from what you've got to say. Lovely. Thank you, Mark. Looking forward to it. Um, I'm going to get Robin to put up my slides because I'm not digital enough to do it myself. Um, thank you. From the beginning, please. <laughs> You've given the game away now. You're a few. You're a few slides in. Lovely. Super. Thank you very much. So, so as Mark said, I'm Sally Meacham, the interim chief executive for the Centre of Digital Public Services. I'm going to just start off with a bit of reflection around um, what's happened in 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 COVID time, and then talk about how uh, we're looking at digital services um, across Wales. So, if we go to the next slide, please. So, as Marcus said, I've been, and he was very kind saying I've been this in uh, 10 to 15 years, but the reality is it's probably a bit more than 20 years that I've been doing digital transformation across the, the public, private and third sector, working with organisations to help them look at how they deliver user-led services, but make sure their organisation's in the right shape, with the right skills to be able to um, deliver um, in an internet age. So, um, my reflection um, through the, the COVID period is, is one of, apart from obviously it being COVID, but from a, a transformational perspective, it has um, made me very happy to see how people have collaborated, um, how people have had a common goal, common priorities, um, how their organisation have moved together to deliver on those, uh, those priorities, to see the removal of ego, little spats, little divisions between functions across an organisation, to see the absolute um, wonderful uh, collaboration with the, with the private sector, with the third sector and with re residents, and to, as I say, work towards a common goal. Um, I think what has enabled this is obviously the, the, the pace and the speed and the need to make change. Um, and also what I've seen personally is quite a few myths being blown out the window. So lots of things that people have said for years and years that you can't do uh, uh, with regards to digital services were very much quickly dismissed because they had to be done. And we were working under a, a, a kind of culture of what can we do as opposed to what can't we do? And that was uh, really refreshing and we managed to move things at pace. We also met each other on a daily basis, uh, sometimes twice a day, all sorts of levels, all working together. Um, and we know from kind of an agile methodology, sort of the daily stand-ups are so critical about ensuring that you're all on the same journey to get things done. And when things aren't working, you just stop them and, and not waste time and move on to what else, uh, another piece of work or, or another approach. So um, we are really, Need, we really need, sorry, we really need to uh, make sure that we keep this culture that we dismiss and uh, the things that have been blocked 
really take a complete risk approach, but to really reassess and relook at our governance structures and our processes, and also the way that our organisation is designed um, to enable us to have a, a, a fluid and agile approach to how we deliver services. Uh, just a brief example of where this has worked really well um, is with um, the uh, Michael Gonofsky, who's the Chief Digital Officer at Naren Bevan, who has uh, who helped with lots of other people, of course, set up an online um, process during COVID very quickly, had to break some rules, but the question is, on reflection, when we look back at it, were all those rules necessary? Were they actually um, become, become unnecessary boundaries? Um, how do we make sure that we take the good bits from that, that change and, and embed them into our organisation? So that is available. Um, that uh, he's, he's going to talk through, he talks through that on one of our monthly knowledge sharing sessions um, on uh, digitalpublicservices.gov.wales. Um, uh, we about that so just my reflection there is how uh, and I love collaboration I love openness and I love trust and I very much work with organizations to really get them to feel comfortable about really um, working in a collaborative way so this does lead me on to um, the Center for Digital Public Services and and why we exist so if you don't mind going to the next slide please so um, the Center for Digital Public Services was it is fairly new it um, and its live status, it's been through a discovery in alpha phase um, where we we were testing the assumption, is there something more we need to be doing in Wales with regards to uh, improving the way that we design and deliver public services? The outputs from that discovery was, yes, there is. Um, and then we went through an alpha phase to look at what it is that we can do to actually start to look at, um, at the skills and, and, and the services that we, we deliver across the public sector. So I'll go into a little bit more about that now. What's really important, I think, is that we are looking at this from a Welsh, the whole of the Welsh public sector, local authorities, health, um, and Welsh government, but also other services that um, have a part to play in the delivery of public services. So that is including housing, the third sector and blue light, etc. So um, we are looking at each time the full journey of the user and quite often it ends up um, being delivered perhaps in a, in, a, in, a, in a third sector place. So we're making sure in um, and it's part of the stakeholder group. So if we move to this next slide, please. So our focus, um, we, we we, we, so we went through Alpha, we finished Alpha in, in March, and that was testing some assumptions that came out of the discovery phase. And now we're into proper land, which is, uh, we've got 12 months funding. Um, and we're what we're concentrating on is three main areas for our remit for this financial year is delivery skills, knowledge sharing. Um, and so we'll go into a bit more detail about what we are doing about those. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, as I said, we've got funding for this financial year. We're very pleased that we also retained our Minister Lee Waters, who's uh, a huge supporter of what we're doing. Um, and and, and understanding the kind of user-led design approach. We have um, uh, two panels, an apprentice panel, an advisory panel. We have representation from across uh, uh, GDS and Scotland, and hopefully we have Northern Ireland in there as well. Um, we are about to say I'm the interim CEO, we're about to recruit a permanent one. We are now getting a, a, a board and chair together, um, and we've gone out for a number of fixed term roles. We're hoping to get um, the agreement that we can uh, consider ourselves as a five year organization so we can have more permanent types of roles but at this point we've gone out and we're very successful very happy to uh, uh, successfully appoint delivery which was Anne Kempster we've also appointed a head of comms and engagement um, to be announced um, and there's a number of roles I think going out this week so please look on our website because there's some really superb roles going out there's head of skills and capability and head of standards and all sorts of other things so please please reply and come and join us um, and talking about the the joining up we work with um, Sam Hall, the CDO for local authorities, Glyn Evans, who's, uh, Glyn Evans, sorry, who is uh, health and social care, and Glyn Jones, who's the, the government, Welsh government CDO. And we meet on a weekly basis because we are very serious about making our plans work together, that we're looking sideways and working out where we can join and where we can get um, consistency across our services. Let's go to the next one, please. So um, we'll go on to delivery. So if the, uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. 
So what we want to be able to do is demonstrate what agile working is, because if you just talk bang on about agile, people get really annoyed and don't understand the word you're saying, which is absolutely fair enough. Um, what does it actually mean in practice? Um, and we have uh, joined up with Blina Gwent, Torvine and Nis, uh, Nis uh, Port Talbot. Uh, we had a, a, a partner, uh, Social Finance, and we got together to find out what it was that we to demonstrate new ways of working that would not just involve the, the digital and IT teams but the whole organisation um, and we uh, came up with access to adult social care and it was important for us to look at something that would have common components across whether it's just the local authorities or actually um, all the public services in Wales so access to government services is obviously critical we need to make it better it needs to be clearer and we need to support our users of the service so we um, if you go to the next slide please Thank you. So with um, that, we've gone through a discovery phase and an alpha phase. So getting together and saying, what's the common problem we're trying to uh, uh, um, solve? Um, we then went to the discovery phase, uh, alpha phase, and got uh, together a very great M MVP. But now we're at the really gnarly stage of saying, OK, we've got this really good service. How is it going to be operated? How is it going to be delivered? Is there one platform? Is there 22 platforms for local government? Um, is there one platform for the whole? lots of things but there's big discussions and big debates um, and um, I would say that it's, it's worked it's really worked very well because we've managed to get not just the people in the IT teams but the whole organization to get involved um, and it has sort of sparked off other good digital stuff within the organizations and that's really kind of what it's about to look at how do we um, demonstrate impact that people want to adopt it themselves it's easier for them people to see things and that's sort of bang on about how good it's, it could be other parts of the work that we're doing in Wales is we're going to be doing a landscape review. We went out to market, we've got a supplier to do that. And basically it is a deep dive and looking at all the public services across Wales, underlying technology and the, uh, the, 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 the contracts that go with it. But the first bit is what services do we have out there? What services needs to uh, be was looked, uh, supported by the Centre for Digital Public Services? Where's the burning platforms? Making sure that we're using evidence and data to we point our resources and our people in the right direction. We work in the Welsh Revenue Authority, who has a brilliant digital team, but wants to be a brilliant digital organisation. So how do we make that work and how do we um, uh, share that knowledge across the Welsh public sector? Sport Wales, they have a grant system, but the people, the seldom heard voices are not re getting those grants. The people they want to get the grants are not able to get them because they're either online or English isn't their first language. So how do we improve the grant system? And that's a, a something system across Wales so all the elements and good stuff that comes out of that and uh, we're working together to look at how we um, do how we do remote working a hybrid working uh, across Wales so try to do it once as opposed to lots of different organizations coming up with policies and and going out and buying 74,000 uh, booking systems so next slide please so skills and capability, really critical came out of our discovery phase as we do not have uh, the anywhere near the capability in in um, in Wales and we have delivered now over 500 courses uh, 500 uh, sessions to digital leaders across Wales to explain what we mean by digital because that's also one of the big sticking points people do tend to think it's technology unless somebody's told them something else so we are working with across the leadership to say it's bigger and broader than that and it doesn't just happen in the technology area your finance person your policy person your uh, people needs to be aligned and understand what this kind of new uh, internet era way of working looks like. Um, so for next slide please. So um, so we are as I said also looking here how we can uh, increase the, 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 the digital skills and capability of, um, of, of leaders but also looking at how we can actually start to deliver courses around specific professions and, and, and looking at and speaking to for example the GDS Academy, the Scottish Digital Academy how have they uh, how have they managed to uh, run their courses and what kind of courses did they have? Because we really don't have things like uh, user researchers and content designers and product designers in the kind of digital data and technology framework type of look. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. So that's we're talking about how do we build the skills and capability for, for, for now, but also how do we get involved in what's our role in building the pipeline of skills and capability for 
and we're working with um, um, the, the universities and the schools and, and sixth forms and higher education to really understand what current so, uh, 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 courses are being delivered. We know there's a big gap around user research, a big gap around service design. Lots of great stuff happening around cyber and, and, and software engineering, but the other parts of digital are not being covered. So what can we do about that? And what's our involvement in that? And that's just a really interesting report that we've, has come out of that. But we're not just about reports, we're about deliveries. And we try and fix it. Um, next slide, please. And service standards came up very strongly in the discovery phase. People wanted to be able to have a, a way of designing, delivering services that are consistent. So if you're going across multiple organizations to look and feel the content the language, it stays, it, it stays the same or as consistent as it possibly can be. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. And so we currently have a set of service standards that we've been working with, with uh, all sorts of uh, organizations um, across the different sectors across Wales and what we do have in Wales which will differ from, um, from, from Scotland and the GDS standards is that we do have the Future Generations Act and really superb brilliant thing for us to have in Wales to follow and make sure that we are building sustainable services and we're thinking about our future generations. We need to always make sure we consider those points, the seven points in the Future Generations Act and also that we are delivering services that are bilingual um, Welsh first, thinking about the Welsh language and the Welsh culture, as opposed to designing them in, uh, in English and then just trying to translate it because that really doesn't work. Um, next slide, please. So, um, sort of circling back on how uh, we are collaborating, how it's important that we get together and do this together for economies of scale, for better user services. We have um, published the digital strategy. For and in that strategy it includes, I'm sorry, I'm going to look at a list because there's the six of them, uh, services, inclusion, skills, uh, economy, connectivity, data and collaboration. So we have together with all those different departments put together this, this, this strategy. But really importantly, we've got an action plan that sits under it and the Centre for Digital Public Services will be working to uh, make sure that this action plan is delivered. Um, and so that really starts to hook up all the things that are really critical a digital nation in Wales. Next slide, please. So uh, we we are all over it. That social media. There's um, there's our, our Twitter handles. Please go on to our website. We also have a, a weekly, uh, so bi-weekly newsletter. We're trying to be in as open, as transparent as we can. Um, we want to know what good stuff's happening out there. We want to be able to share that information. And as I'm here talking about Wales, I'd just like to say that Wales. Is beautiful place to live and it is a very great place to work and it's getting better there's lots of money to be spent on digital and there's lots of help that's needed to help us deliver their digital strategy for wales so thank you thanks so much Danny. that was uh, really inspiring and uh, uh i can't believe you've got around 500 digital leaders in wales that's just just the extraordinary achievement um we are out of time um we haven't got time to have a a bit of a chat and I was particularly interested in asking you for any early kind of indications of, of some of the kind of redesigning of services that you're seeing as being likely but um, that's going to have to wait for uh, another time. Um, anyway uh, for some of us on this call um, it sounds like there's some really exciting and interesting roles for digital leaders in Wales so uh, so sign up and apply but thank you so much for your time really interesting to hear about that particularly yeah. I love the Future Generations Act which kind of builds on something I said in the intro way up this morning about um, what are we doing about future public, uh, you know, um, what are we doing about future digital infrastructure and commons for future generations? Are we just treading water? Or are we actually thinking strategically? So, um, yeah, very welcome. Very interesting. Mark, Thank you so much. Mark, you do, yes. you do have a few minutes because Colin is just having some connectivity issues. Okay. So while we fix minutes. Colin, do, do chat away, please. Yeah, okay. Are you happy to chat away while we, uh, and then uh, we can tap dance if we need to, to uh, talk about it. done my bit, moment. Mark. I thought I've done my bit. You said 20 minutes. No, I'm joking, of course. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, well, so in that case, having threatened that I would have asked you for any early indications of sort of areas of service redesign that kind of look, you know, coming out of your review, um, I'm going to deliver on that threat. Any, any, any thoughts about that? So we've literally just um, run the, the procurement to bring in a, an organisation to help us run this. So we haven't got any data back, so we haven't even started it. But I think the um, uh, it is going to be a really critical, very difficult piece of work. 
um, because we don't want this to be seen as we come to spy on you. It is what's going on out there. How are these services working? Is there any look across? If someone's about to use this service, actually, if you would put this next part of the, the, the chain of the service together as one service, is that going to make the, 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 the that, that service better for the user? And I think this is really what we're trying to look up, is how do we join up um, the service provision we have, not just in the kind of the, the design of it and the content, et cetera, but just literally your journey. How do we improve that? So that's what we're looking to get out of this. We're looking to get hold of some really big, gnarly pieces of work that we can say, OK, let's all get together and let's really fix this once and for all. And I think whatever we get hold of, whatever the big things we get hold of, there'll be so much learning across every public. We do know that there's differences, but there's some fundamental things. I want to book something. I want some information. And there's some, as you, you know more than anyone, there's a lot of commonality about the services. It's just kind of the nature and the content that goes with it. So um, we're, we're really looking forward to that. I think the kind of next phase, We'll be looking at um, the underpinning technology again. Is there a way that we can have common platforms? I was speaking to Tom this morning about the work they're doing about platforms, and we'll be very much involved in in that and understanding where that goes to next. Um, and uh, one of the things that's much, much very close to my heart is around the commercial arrangements. I, I, I do know when I was at Crown Commercial Service, you kind of within a month, you can look across those dead contracts that um, nobody's using and there's some quite significant savings to be make made. So there's a kind of what's the existing we're spending our money on, but also starting to look to the future and around spend coordination about how we can ensure that we are starting to spend our money better, that we have a we are better clients, we're better, we work, we work in more partnership, but also we're more savvy about the requir our requirements um, and we can have a more kind of equal conversation with the suppliers. And again, looking across and see who else wants to join and who's doing something similar. So it's a big piece of work. Northern Ireland's done it really well, actually. Uh, we've been talking a lot with them um, and we're, to say, we're just about to embark on it in Wales. That's really fascinating, actually. So gradual convergence around around the common stuff. And I suppose the common stuff being common stuff, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for Wales to build its own version of all the common stuff. <laughs> but um, no, I, mean, I guess that's it. Yeah, we, 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 you know, we're not proud. If there's something's really good, then we're going to use it. But we do really need to make sure that, um, again, we're not trying to... Uh, mash something into something that doesn't quite fit for Wales. Um, um, and so we do really need to make sure that we really do understand our requirements um, and look, first port of call is who else has these, who could meet those requirements. And so, so I think there's going to be, and Tom I, and I were speaking this morning, uh, much more join up with, with, with Tom and Wales and, and Scotland. I think it kind of already happens and Northern Ireland, but actually really bringing that together on a bit more of a strategic level about who's doing what and and, and what 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 you're going out for what's the big things you're going out for and also you know what are they charging you because that's another thing we don't discuss what the suppliers are charging so and i'm not saying they're out to get us in any way shape or form perhaps there's a way that we can have better economies of scale across but more across transparency is definitely a good thing it's interesting hearing you talk about those con bits and the but also not being shy of you know doing building stuff when you need to and and um you know what i teach my mba is is it's all about kind of uh you know focusing on where you add value building something whether it actually adds value to citizens lives to have a local version of something versus increasingly where you're just wasting their precious resources by replicating what we really should be consuming out the cloud or wherever it is and and um and i increasingly personally think that's the key architectural decisions about public value about where you, where you spend and where you consume um that affects digital leaders and i, and I personally i see that as just growing and growing really no, I think so. I, I think, again, sort of coming out of COVID, well, we're not coming out of COVID, but the, what we've learned from COVID about public sector is we can move quicker at better pace if our leaders create the environment to do that. And that environment includes being able to speak to other people at a very kind of deep level and really talking about facts and figures and numbers and really really sharing this information um i think that's critical and that's what i hope we can continue to do because that moves things quicker and we save money and you talked a bit earlier in your in your talk about an increasing willingness that you'd seen during the pandemic to collaborate so you're talking about you know across not just public sector but partners private sector partners third sector blue light housing etc etc and just trying to follow the whole user journey 
is how real is that? And what some of us are afraid of is that post pandemic, everyone will just go back to what they were <laughs> go back to what they were doing in their in their comfortable silos. And do you think this is a permanent pivot? I, I think we need to work on it very hard. I don't think we can make any assumptions whatsoever. Just because we learned something, it was it was good. It worked really well. Perhaps there was a few little bumps, but actually, in essence, um, you didn't need those fourteen layers of governance. You, that risk could have been that risk level could have been slightly lowered because basically, if you didn't do that, then people would die. Things like that. Um, so I do think that um, we can't take anything for granted. We still need to support those people within the organisations that have seen 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 the, the good stuff and wants to be able to make sure that's retained. I think one of the biggest things for me is that I see it all the time, I only swore there, but I didn't, silos within organizations, it makes me so angry, um, silos in organizations, and a lot of it's because they really do have really conflicting um, priorities, and they haven't agreed as an organization what the priorities are. With, the, with COVID, that was the priority, safety, health, making sure people got their services um, during the pandemic and, and, and people worked well. And I think that um, we need the leadership to really be brave because there's some, always some very tricky people across those boards um, uh, to, to say, OK, we, we need to agree on, on what, what our vision is, what is we're going to live, what impact we want to make and what our priorities are. Um, that happened in COVID. I, and I think there was also this this idea that people were meeting on a date, you know, senior people, but not just senior people. It was really open to anybody who was part of that delivery um, process. And they were meeting and with the chief exec and also all sorts of levels were meeting on a daily basis because they collectively were going to be the ones that were going to deliver. And that was that was great. It was it was really lovely to see. So again, it's about sort of um, not losing the, the empowerment these people felt when there was a, a when there was a whether well, there is a pandemic on, but actually delivering public services and making sure people get what they need and they're safe is something that we should be thinking of every day, not just during a pandemic. I think it pretty it picks up beautifully on the on what Secretary State Matt Hancock said this morning about just you know. Um yeah just just not leaving it there and actually what what does new look like and not being afraid to as you put it i suppose challenge your myths sally thank you so much um i've just heard a sort of secret channel from robin that says uh that tom reed is ready to go so you're talking about your chats uh, with him um thank you so much for your time oh she's vanished but anyway thank you so much uh really really interesting chat and discussion um so if i could welcome uh, tom reed on stage if you're here tom that would be great. Um, so Tom is uh, CEO and Director General at GDS. So Sally's just been talking about, welcome. So she's been talking about um, obviously the need to start to collaborate amongst the regions and certainly where there's you know, talking about shared platforms and opportunities and, and um, all sorts of stuff. We had a really interesting chat. I don't know how much of that you heard. Um, but um, uh, yeah, enough from, enough flam from me. We're all very eager to uh, to hear what you've got to say, and uh, particularly, it's, it's just very enlightening hearing the different regional strategies coming out of the pandemic and what your priorities are. Looking forward very much hearing what you've got to say. Excellent, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I'll tell you what. I'm going to assume yes and try to share my screen. Right, is, is anyone able to just give, give me a nod that that's working? I'm going to assume that's working. Perfect. Yes, it's working, Tom. Lovely. OK, so uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'll try to, uh, I've got lots of slides, but they're all images, so don't worry about it. I'm just going to use them to sort of uh, remind myself what I'm meant to be talking about. So uh, thank you for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, I'm Tom. I am the chief executive of the Government Digital Service. I've been in post for about four months now, so I'm not completely um, but uh, equally still uh, sort of learning. So I want to talk a little bit about what, kind of where we've got to in, in central government digital services, uh, what we're going to do next, and, and, and how we're going to go about it. So I'll, I'll try to sort of uh, rattle through these uh, at, at the pace. Um, right, quick history lesson first, because I think this is quite fun. So if you look back into the, the, the history of government services, this is where it started off. Um, when the internet started to be a thing and it moved on from GIS uh, to UK Online. Uh, if you look at these little uh, images there that Jerry Fishenden um, uh, alerted me to, uh, we'll come back to those later. And then it moved on to Business Link and Direct Gov, which were sort of 
links through to uh, individual government websites and services, but at least there was sort of a central place where they were collated. And obviously in 20, uh, 10, 2011, that was replaced by the first prototypes of Gov.uk, uh, and Gov.uk is now 10 years old. And really importantly, central government uh, departments have held the line. Um, they, we haven't seen a proliferation of uh, in, individual sort of different look and feel or, or branded uh, websites over the last 10 years. So I, I think that's uh, just an enormous hat tip to my predecessors, but more to people working all across government and in GDS who have done this incredible work uh, over the last 10 years. Um, along with uh, sort of the central publishing platform, um, there's some really amazing services that are built uh, with almost no help from GDS, uh, just built by the really amazing digital teams that now sit in a lot of departments and agencies and, and, and are much, much, much more mature than they were a year ago, uh, 10 years ago. So apply online for a UK passport or renew a passport. It's one of my favorites. I think it's just uh, exactly how services should work. Send money to someone in prison, apply for universal credit, personal tax accounts. These are some amazing services uh, and, and really weird. It's sort of the, the envy of the, of the world when we look at these individual transactional services that are built around the needs of the citizen. Um, there's a long way to go, though. Uh, we tend to talk about these because they look and feel really nice and we kind of forget about these sorts of things I won't call out because I'll offend people on the call, but there's an awful lot of what is uh, run by central government that uh, is not yet uh, quite where you'd want it to be. Um, there are also more than 3,000 paper forms uh, in, in government uh, on, on gov.uk. So in fact, just by number of, tra number of uh, services, there are more PDFs uh, than there are actual digital services. Um, we tend not to talk about them because they have a low number of, in, of, of transactions per year. So I, I call it the long tail uh, of, of, of yet to be digitized. Um, but because then their low transaction doesn't mean they're not important. There's some really important things in there, things like adopting a child, changing your name by deed poll. And some of these things are really quite complex to fill in. This is like some really complex sort of uh, if if then or, or uh, logic that somebody's uh, built into to a PDF, which of course then you need to print out and post in because it needs a signature. So there's a lot to do uh, uh, around that area as well. Um, so we've come a long way, but we're a long way from done. So what's next with GDS itself? Um, which really what I mean by that is what's the point of a central digital department in 2021? Individual government departments and agencies have amazing talent now, amazing chief digital officers, uh, designers, software developers, architects, that they're, they're really good. They don't need GDS in the way that they needed GDS 10 years ago to kind of say, this is what good looks like. This is the kind of talent you need. You know, release the shackles, go, go, go. We don't need that anymore, really, because departments are doing that already. So what's the point of the job I've just taken? Um, is what I've been looking at over the last sort of uh, three or four months. So a couple of illustrations uh, just sort of show what I mean. So if you want to get... Uh, help with childcare. Let's say you've just had a baby or you just your financial situation's changed. Um, you obviously go to the front door of government, which is, which is Google. Um, and then you, you'll get to this design pattern that I quite like that was brought in about five years ago, which is a step-by-step. -step. I like it a lot because it, it, it shows you all the different things you might need to do uh, around that sort of holistic user journey. I also don't like it because it's kind of like, it's a checklist sort of highlighting the dysfunction of, of how government is designed. Um, so just, just on this, so find out how you can get help with childcare costs and where you can get childcare and get help with, with it being paid uh, and, and your circumstances change, go to that service. Then if your child is a bit older, go to that service. And each of these services takes you to other services, so lists of services. Uh, and some of these are fully sort of digitized ones. Um, some of them are local government. Uh, some of them um, take away and you've got to sign up through that. So for, for, for the user, you start with get help with childcare and that's a super confusing user journey. And I don't mean that in any way to, uh, to sort of denigrate the work of those individual departments or agencies or local government, but for a user, that is the dysfunctional sort of structures of, of government um, forcing them into a really, really confusing place. You wouldn't design this if we were a profit-seeking organization. I won't labor the point, but if you think it's difficult doing childcare, try, try importing or exporting goods. Um, you have to do a lot of services, and a lot of these services um, 
lead you on to another one. And, and because we don't know much about you, um, you've got to read, you know, 20 pages of well-written content, only a couple of lines uh, of which uh, really relates to, to your situation. So we're making it really complicated for the user because every time you come to, to government, we treat you like a stranger. And, and we think that uh, we can make that simpler. Uh, last one is, is just 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 because it makes me chuckle. Uh, who do I need to tell that I've moved house? And and one example, DVLA, who have a fantastic digital team, but just telling DVLA you've changed your address, not government, just the DVLA, you've got to update your driver's license, update your vehicle logbook, update your direct debit, uh, and, and some other bits if you've got some extra. And some of these are really fantastic services. Some of them take you on to other portals that you need to, to log into. Some of them take you on to things I've never seen before, um, but all of them start from, from that user journey. Um, and then you, with this one, you've got to phone, you've got to phone them at the end, which is, uh, which is fun. So again, not, not criticizing, not here to criticize anyone. I'm just trying to just show that for the end user, individual transactional journeys are only part of the problem and part of the solution. So our vision is to get a joined up and personalized experience for government, uh, of government for everyone. So everyone should have a personalized experience based, uh, so you only find out the information and services that are actually relevant to you, because the rest is just noise and confusing often at a very vulnerable moment in your life uh, where you don't need noise and confusion. So what can we do from the center? Um, there are some services that can only be designed uh, and run from the center. Uh, not many, but only some of them. Gov.uk is obviously one. I'll come on to a single sign-on for government uh, uh, in a minute as, as a second. There are also, as I've explained, user journeys that span multiple departments, multiple agencies, um, where the accountability uh, is, is shared or muddy. And, and we also want to carry on doing products that should be built once and reused widely. Um, so, uh, you know, Sally's talked about there are some edge cases where you wouldn't want to just take a product and implement it. But I still think we, we haven't quite gone as far as we want to with what we have called government as a service. Um, and I'm not going to get into the government as a service or government as a platform or platform as a government because but, but that was a fun conversation a few years ago. Um, so so those, are, those are three areas we want to play in. And so we've come up with five missions. Number one, the most important is Gov.uk. If we do nothing else, we're going to support Gov.uk, uh, continue to iterate it, make it even more usable. There's some platform upgrades we need to do. We need to fix search, which doesn't work as well as it should do. Uh, and we've got a new homepage coming. Um, whole user journeys I've kind of talked about. This is roughly what it might look like. You'll sign into a Gov.uk account. Um, we started looking at one whole user journey because we thought it would be a simple one, uh, which is starting and sustaining a business. Turns out it's really complicated. Um, so we've done some some sort of uh, services, start of a service that sort of takes you through almost what, you know, when I, I'm quite old, when I was young, you called a wizard. So it sort of takes you through each screen to make that a fully personalized service. Um, we need to get through some of those really crunchy problems around can you know the department of business can they share their data do they want to share their data uh same with hmrc you know who, who then is in charge of that who has responsibility for it if it goes wrong or if it goes right so there's some really really crunchy problems uh and that, that we're, we're getting through with with that one and and after and, and in in parallel next few months we're spinning up teams to look at some or none of the following i'm not sure what we're going to do yet we're going to look at how we prioritize these, but these are some of the things you might want to look at as whole services. Um, yeah, retiring as a service or just traveling abroad as a service. These, these are ones that lead off to lots and lots of um, different transactional silos. Um, so that's that's whole services. One login for government. I'm not going to talk much about Verify other than to say it is significantly better than, 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 than people like to make out. Um, it has 7 million live users, 2 million more people signed up um, during lockdown and furlough to sign up for universal credit. However, if it was perfect, we wouldn't be doing this project. There are things it doesn't quite do uh, that we want it to. So we're building a new uh, one login for government and identity assurance uh, uh, set of services. Um, the real difference this time is we're going to use government data to validate who you are rather than using private sector data uh, and credit agencies. So that's the real difference. And we think there's a huge benefit for the user. There are a lot of ways of signing in and proving your identity uh, across government, and it is very confusing. Uh, these aren't my slides, but I really like them. Um, 
if you the, the the logic is here if you're using one bit of Spotify and then you had to log into another bit or uh, to you, you'd think that was that was crazy. Um, same with Instagram and and you know all these sorts of services. We want it to look and feel something like this. It's sort of a a gate you've got to get through. So it's not serving a need in itself. It's like no no user need no no users ever had the need. You know I really want to log into government. It's site it's a gate you have got to get through. And we want to make that simple uh, and straightforward for absolutely everyone. Uh, in society and then we'll have this is an old slide as well then we'll have one login for all of your services uh, and we can use uh, native apps for that we're looking at different solutions for that we'll reuse it across government and one day we'll fill your forms in for you and I, I think this is this is really really exciting so if we know a lot about you and and you know that acknowledging the fear people have of government knowing lots about you if we know a lot about you you probably don't need to fill in those forms. If we know your tax, your your income, your property, your vehicles, your benefit status, we probably know enough about you to be able to do one-click services. And I think that's the sort of nirvana, I think, where we'd like to get to for users who want to use that. Uh, I don't see any 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 time when this would be mandated. Um, and we'll put people in charge of their data. So that, that's three. So that, that's the uh, one login for government. I'm really, really excited about that one. Uh, number four is wholesale services or government as a platform, as we've sort of called it before. Um, uh, this is cute. Uh, so, so look, a lot of government uh, across the world have copied our services, notify, pay, uh, the platform as a service. They're doing really, really well, used very heavily in uh, devolved uh, administrations, used very heavily in local government, used in the NHS. Um, next up is trying to look at the long tail of forms um, because I, it just it's a it, it just really bothers me. So we're we're building a thing that we used to call submit, but I'm not meant to call submit now. It's called collect information from users or similar. But basically, we want to have a really really simple sort of uh, WYSIWYG editor to create digital services um, when otherwise people would just put put another form up. Um, so we're in sort of uh, end of discovery on that. We're going to go quite big on that and try to go out and help departments to, to get rid of that long tail of uh, forms. And finally, the one that we haven't really looked into yet, but we think is a good idea. In Estonia, they've got a thing called the X Road. Um, I haven't got a thing for Singapore, but they've got the same. A lot of governments around the world now have a really, really skinny sort of record of the citizen and then a, a logical structure of where data is around government and private AP, APIs with sharing agreements so that you don't have this sort of this sort of incredibly complicated bilateral agreements between every agency that needs data from another agency or feels they can't get that data so they can create their own database and you get duplications. We're going to have a go at fixing government data uh, in partnership with lots and lots of other bits of government. Um, if you want to read any more about this, there's a blog post we published uh, last month, um, and that's otherwise me done. Thank you. There, Mark. <clears throat> yeah. Robin and I, I, I have a secret suspicion Robin puts me on mute from behind and it's not my user error. Um, that's so invigorating and you've been in post for four months. That's extraordinary. Uh, that's an extraordinary list of things that you're you're looking into. Um, so just, just um, unfortunately, Colin Cook has had a sort of disastrous broadband outage, so he won't be joining us. Um, so that does, if you're happy to stay on for five or six minutes of kind of wrap up chat, that would be really great. And then we'll just break happy. four or five minutes early for lunch. Fantastic. So um, you mentioned uh, Jerry Fishenden, um, long-standing long -standing mate of mine. Um, uh, so he's the great government historiographer, isn't he? And I, I love the way that you, you showed some of those kind of early uh, early slides of government services. So Jerry's becoming a bit more concerned potentially about, you know, uh, so about how we manage that. And I think you briefly alluded to it, actually that tension between increasing desire for increasing personalization you know we want government to know about us and in fact so much so that a lot of the government interaction a bit like going to the bank i don't need to do anyway and, and i love the way that you described the front door of government as being google i just thought that was fantastic um but equally i think jerry is concerned about how you know without without getting into a kind of big brother thing but concerned about how you know for example Currently, the state separates some of its functions, uh, you know, and, and they can't talk to each other and they can't kind of collude. And, and um, you know, whether whether you hear whether in voices like Jerry um, or whether you hear of sort of, uh, you know, growing um, uh, 
uh, awareness of the, of the need to have that discussion at policy levels, I suppose. Where you yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a really interesting question and, and something that, that we're, we're thinking about really, really carefully. Um, so I, I don't have sort of a set, uh, you know, sub, uh, sort of a conclusion on this yet, but they're, they're broadly, pe people, when we've done user research, people fall into one of two or three categories. The main category, and I'm not saying this is everybody, but the main category is people assume that we do that already. The main, ca people assume that if you're on benefits, DWP speaking to HMRC already and, and vice versa, um, they assume that my old gig and MOJ, they assume that when you get locked up and sent to prison, your benefits will automatically stop. They assume that all those things happen. And that, that is the, the main thing we're finding out. And actually, interestingly, the, a lot of the user research participants we've spoken to also assume that local government is kind of part of central government as well. They don't see much of a distinction. So they're very confused when they move house and nobody collects their bins. You know, it's sort of, uh, I'm exaggerating, but so, so that, that's one category. C category two are, are people who really want to understand what you would use the data for and have some really clear red lines, often about health data with central government. But, you know, some of them are, are about things that feel either um, would impinge on civil liberties um, and give government too much knowledge um, or perhaps uh, things that just have that slightly sort of um, surreal feel to them. Like if you went on gov.uk and you tried to fill in your tax thing and it said, oh, by the way, your car MOT is due, you, you might, it might feel okay or it might feel a bit weird. So that, that's the second category. People who are interested want to do it because that's how the rest of their digital lives work, but, but are, are nervous. And then you've got category three, which is people are like, hell no, I don't want to do this. And I think um, uh, th that third category of people, I think, you know, it's a policy question, as you rightly say, and a political question. My, my view is we always need an off-ramp for those people. Um, and and it's going to be more difficult for them to do it, right? It's going to be more difficult for them to do things if they don't want to share data. And that's not like a, a blackmail thing. It's just a, it's a reality. Things offline take longer and are more difficult, but you need to offer people that level of sort of uh, independence from, from government knowing everything about them. So big, big policy questions uh, that we're going to be addressing um, and very much working with DCMS as well as they look at their new sort of uh, bills around the future of, uh, you know, data protection and those sorts of things. And, and actually, you, you touched on data a bit earlier. And, and um, I remember having a very interesting chat with Mr. Loosemore a few years ago about registers, the notion of registers. Mm. You know? So if you're looking at Estonian, you know, X Road and, and Singapore and other models, I just wonder whether, because obviously one of the ideas, I think, as I understand it, behind registers is you have a registrar who's responsible for the, for uh her or his register and then uh and then effectively you, you you interrogate them with tokens rather than passing data around and therefore some of these some of these separations can maintain what's what's the state of your thinking about all of that stuff and where's that likely to go or is it early days it, so early days <clears throat> early days but lots of thinking you know after not by me but people who, who have been thinking about this for the last few years uh so the first thing about registers is i kind of misunderstood what was meant by registers five years ago or so when when Paul Downey was there and Tom Loosemore and others, which was really talking about registers of public, structured public information, um, which is one thing and not not something we're focusing on at the moment, but it but it could be something that comes come, comes away. as in data that you could download as a CSV or you might want to programmatically access it, but 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 public they open data. What what I'm quite interested in is a model I think uh, the German government's done quite recently, which is basically they they looked at this this uh, more of an internal register, you know what, what we used to call databases, um, and just go what is the golden record? So um, leaving address aside for a minute because it's really hard, but up your salary detail, income details, who who holds that record, right? And then identify that is that DWP, is that HMRC? W work it out and say right that is the golden record. Fix, you know, help them, pay them to, to fix up that database, put rigor around it, put an API, get sharing, you know, programmatic sharing agreements. Um, so it's, uh, you know what I mean, access through code uh, around that, and then make that accessible to the rest of government subject to that sharing agreement. And you do that for, for salary, for address, for uh, for property information, for what vehicles you have. And, and, then, and then you start to build internal registers uh, and you basically say to other departments, just 
trust trust this stop you don't need to build your own uh you know register of how much people earn because that one's going to be available so i think that's where we want to go massive caveat no idea whether it's deliverable or not uh but that's where we want to go <laughs> that's totally fascinating the other the other fascinating thing is i, I think uh, it, it is your attention as opposed to starting to consolidate commoditize kind of back-end technology call them platforms or call them whatever and no we're not going to go into government platform platform for government that was my conversation a few years ago um but uh, I, know, I think it's, cool. it's 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 massively it's massively welcome i think for for lots and lots of people i suppose my final final question again it's it's very early days for you but um you know there's lots certainly from an industry perspective there's lots of increasing interest of course in emerging tech so so you know whether it's ai or, or machine learning or or you know automation all these all these cloud-based technology and services um mm -hmm which which naturally appear to sort of live a bit like the way lots of people have businesses that just live in eBay, you know, in places like AWS and, 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 and Azure, etc. What's what's your sort of sense of um, government's engagement with those in terms of, um, you know, uh, could there be a kind of set of standards or gateway or, or, or do you see what I mean, giving people across government building digital services for guidance and advice on how to connect with and consume those sorts of services that government is unlikely to build itself, I would imagine. Yeah. <clears throat> um, not something I've given tons of thought about, but uh, let, let me give you an answer. Sort of. So, so one thing to note is <clears throat> as of uh, a few months ago, a bunch of the sort of standards controls bits left GDS and went to another bit of the cabinet office, which I know is a sort of thing government does all the time, but just, just worth mentioning that in case I'm speaking on behalf of somebody else. I think I think the key thing, the key things we need to do um, for, from the centre, uh, apart from making people aware of these amazing services that they want to try to build themselves. I mean, if you just look, uh, if you just look at AWS's AI portfolio around you know, facial recognition around, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 text, vo voice to text around, or, you know, all, all these things are not, it's not rocket science, but they're really quite complicated. Um, they are really good services and people need to know about them and work out how you can embed that in their services. Um, the thing that I'm worried about is the more of those sorts of proprietary services you start using, the more you're locked into that ecosystem and the more you're locked into that ecosystem, no offense to this particular vendor, but we could wake up in 20 years and AWS could be the new Oracle or Microsoft, you know, Azure could be the new SAP. And I, and I think you need to, we don't want to sleepwalk into that, but equally we don't want to ignore amazing tech innovations um, just because of that sort of uh, technical and commercial tie-in. So I think there's some work there of, of how, how to disaggregate services and not buy into an ecosystem that I, that I think we need to be talking about. Really important work. And let's face it, there's, there's not much choice, is there, at the moment, really? We talk a lot, but it's about Google and it's about Azure and it's about AWS at the moment. Right. I mean, there's, you know, so government hasn't got a lot of places to go. And that is, that is a, I think it's going to be a real emerging mm -hmm. headache. <laughs> um, listen, um, that's a really interesting chat. We've gone uh, all afternoon. Um, I just, I've, I really, really enjoyed it. I found your, I found your kind of vision after four months of, of kind of a bunch of stuff that GDS really is getting to get its teeth into, really encouraging. And uh, I'm personally very happy that future GDS is in your hands this time. Uh, so, so um, you know, it's, That's it's, very it's kind wonderful of you. to hear from you. And uh, thanks for making the time to talk to us. Not at all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Cheers. So uh, that brings uh, to an end part three of our four part uh, session. Um, and uh, so it's lunchtime now. I'm sure um, lots of you'd be glad to, to hear that. Uh, and we're going to meet back for um, part four at two o'clock uh, when we're going to hear from our final uh, speakers on very different takes on leadership um, uh, needed currently across SMEs, business, health sector and social enterprise. So we're going to take that. We've taken a regional focus just now and we're going to take that sectoral focus um, finally uh, today. So uh, have a great lunch and uh, look forward to seeing you again too.